Proverbs. You know, Proverbs is a good, all the Proverbs are really good, and I used to read them like by day. But if you guys would just be there and focus on uh, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, that's the part of the scripture that I want to focus on today. And it says there, these things, these six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. And so the title of my message today is Seven Are an Abomination. You know, and I really, uh, the reason that I'm doing this is obviously I'm not going to do another Halloween message, but it's real important to understand the things that God looks at. And, and, and I like the way he separates it. He says, these six things does the Lord hate, yet seven are an abomination or an abhorrence. Like, it's deep hatred if you have all seven of these attributes. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to take a look and break down these abominations when it's all together. Now, well, the first thing I want to say and I want to make clear is that if you, if we're guilty of one of these on its own, you know, well, we're all sinners saved by grace. So there's time when we have sin in our life. But the Lord is specifically saying that these th seven things together are an abomination unto the Lord. And if you look there and, uh, you know, if, if you guys want to just do a, like a little study on abominations, uh, Leviticus 5 through 20 refers to a series of abominations anywhere from food to uh, immorality, what we need to understand, and, and for me this is real important because coming from a Seventh-day Adventist background, you know, uh, one of the things that the Adventists focus on is that they focus on a lot of the ceremonial laws. But there's ceremonial laws that are an abomination, but there's also the moral laws. Well, when Jesus came, the ceremonial laws got rid of, or they were done away with, but the moral laws became even stronger. And I'm just going to give you two verses there, but if you guys will go to 1 Peter 5, and I'm just going to read... So go to 1 Peter 5. I'm just going to read there. Matthew 5, 17 says, Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus came to fulfill the law, right? And it says in Acts 10, 15, it says, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this is referring to when Peter was shown the unclean meat. And Peter said, I've never taken the unclean meat. But God said, Look, what I cleanse, don't call on common. So, you know, a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, or even there's uh, Baptists and other religions that don't eat certain foods based on the Old Testament. But the challenge is that, you know, if you're doing that as a, as a work for your salvation or for your righteousness, then it's no benefit to you. Now, if you're doing that because you think it's healthy, that's different. But that's really where I wanted to focus on. But let's go ahead and just take a look. So, verse 16 says, These, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. And verse 17, the first thing we're going to see is a proud look. And 1 Peter 5 is going to give us some reference into that proud look. The Bible says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. And the reason I covered that verse is because, I mean, that one covers the spectrum, right? What's the opposite of pride is to be humble. And the God says that he resisteth the proud and he giveth grace to the humble. And he's talking specifically here to the shepherd that we need to feed the flock, but we need to do it for the right reasons, right? We need to go ahead and do it because he doesn't want us to be Lord over his heritage. We need to do it willingly not for filthy lucre's sake. And, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about, uh, I guess what you call the new IFB movement, or what I appreciate about these like-minded individuals, even Pastor Cobb, is that they're not doing it for filthy lucre's sake. Uh, you know, I've, I know Pastor Cobb. I've seen the books. I know his salary. And believe me, he is not preaching God's word for uh, filthy lucre's sake. He's doing it willingly so that as to the Lord and to feeding the flock 
Um, and what God says there is that when he, we do that, he's going to give us grace and he's going to resist the proud. Um, if you turn there, and by the way, keep your finger on Proverbs 6, but if you turn there to Psalm 40, you know, pride is a sin that holds many people back from the simple gift of salvation. When we're going out there soul winning, one of the hardest things to do is sometimes people just get it. They understand it all and you ask them to pray. And there's just like the one thing, I, the biggest excuse I hate listening to is the one that they're like, right now is not the time or I'm not ready to make that decision because what they're telling you is that they're being prideful or they just, you know, that pride doesn't allow them to humble themselves before the Lord. If you look there in Psalm 40 verse 1, this makes a little bit of reference to that. It says, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of the, uh, out of a, out of an horrible pit out of a, the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. You see, this is a picture of salvation, you know, being pulled out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay and set his feet upon a rock, that rock being Jesus Christ, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even a praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear it and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. You know, one of the things that we, in a couple of weeks, uh, actually, now that I think about it, uh, is Thursday or Friday of this week, is the elections, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, I think November, I don't know, I don't vote anymore, because, you know, it's the same. Uh, I saw this really cool uh, cartoon, and it was a... An, a a cow being led to the slaughter and they had a partition in the middle like this and uh, you know I got it's horrible but and on one side it said Democrat and on the other side it said Republican you know and obviously but both of them led into the slaughterhouse and that's literally what it is it's the it's the two sides of the same coin and one of the things that we have to be really careful with is the reason that I abhor politics in today's America is that there's just all it is is about pride and Christianity, though, has gotten on the side of pride. They respect the proud. I mean, think about how many uh, believing or self-proclaiming Christians get behind someone like President Trump. And, you know, I don't, I'm not going to get into the politics of thing, but if you've ever heard even just a few minutes of President Trump, you know he's about the proudest guy you're ever going to hear. I mean, nothing that ever comes out of his mouth is but pride. I mean, that guy's just about as braggadocious as any human being on the face of this planet could be. Everything he does is great. Everything he touches is gold. He has no need to ask for forgiveness from Jesus Christ because, I mean, the guy just does no wrong. Everything he does is great and good. And, all. and what does the Bible say? It says in verse 3 of Psalms, it says, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear it and shall trust in the Lord. Well, how do we call on the Lord? We call upon His name, right? Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. So see, it's not just that we shouldn't respect the proud, but it's those that are pride, uh, their pride is leading you into the lies of the world. You know, if you go to Isaiah 13, verse 9, and, and just keep your finger there again on, on Proverbs 6, because we're going to be going back and forth. But uh, Isaiah 13, verse 9 says, Behold... The day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, and the sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause our light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to seize, and will lay low the haughtiness of of the terrible. Now, I could have picked so many verses on pride, but these really stood out because that's the environment that we're in right now. You know, there's a couple of things that are going to happen this week, and that's why I thought it was relevant. We've got the elections coming up, and even though I preached on it last week, there's a, it's good to keep it on the forefront so that we don't partake in it, is that we've got Halloween just around the corner, and those two uh, events or series of things that happen celebrate pride, you know, celebrate the proud and, and the arrogancy of the people. and you know, Halloween is arrogancy towards God, saying we can just, uh, you know, be in the demonic realm and, and still be Christian. And in the polit political world, it doesn't matter how prideful someone is, as long as they do what I ask them when I vote for them, it's okay. So, 
And, and again, let me back up. If you have pride in your life, fix it. Pride itself is not an abomination, although I think that if you just delve deeply into pride, you're going to end up with all these other attributes and it will be abominable. But, you know, sometimes we get prideful, you know, maybe our kids do something great or, or we feel like we accomplished something, but we need to look to God so that He humbles us so that we can have that grace that He gives to the humble. So if you go back to Proverbs, and we're going to go back there, if you, if, there on verse 17, He says, okay, so these are the six things, a proud look, the second thing is a lying tongue. And I think these things are done in order because if you're prideful, well, one of the things that pride does is that it leads into lying. Because when you have pride, especially in, in a work environment or in a business environment, if you say something with this kind of confidence or pride that uh, you think you know it all and you end up being caught uh, in a falsehood, sometimes you get entrenched to push uh, uh, a lie because you, you're so prideful that you can't allow yourself to be at fault or wrong about something. Let's look at what the Bible tells us about a lying tongue. It just says there, you don't have to turn there because these are quick verses. If you want to uh, get ahead, go to Matthew 27. But in John 8, verse 44 says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So we have to be very careful about lying. And, and the challenge is that, you know, these things become an abomination because they're kind of like, a, I would call them gateway sins. In the sense that, you know, if you have a tendency to lie, even if you tell a fib, a fib turns into a white lie. And a white lie turns into a, 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 an elusive lie. And then... And then you're now you're, you're, you've got this whole story you've got to remember about this one lie that started out as something small. Well, what ends up happening is if, if you're really entrenched in it, it could lead to premeditative sin and mischief of things that you're going to do, which is going to lead me to the next point. But I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let's just look there in Revelation 21.8, and then we're going to be in Revelation uh, 22 as well. It says, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And it's interesting that God includes all liars just to make sure that, you know, a proud, it's not just enough if you have a proud look. A lying tongue can get you to hell because we're all sinners and we've all fa fallen short of the glory of God. Revelation 21, 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter into anything, into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then Revelation 22, 15 says, For without are dogs and sorcerers, without, meaning not in, they're, they're cast out. It says, For without are dogs, and, and when the Bible references dogs, it's also referencing the sodomites, the reprobates. It says, And sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So see, you know, sometimes we tell lies. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners. But here, it's those who are uh, loving and making a lie. Well, what does the world do? What does the, uh, what does the, the false teacher do? They love twisting stories. They love making lies. I mean, just pick any false religion out there. And what's the one thing that they've done? They've created this elaborate, intricate story to prove their religion. I mean, uh, case in point, the Seventh-day Adventists, I mean, they waited on the side of a hill back in like the 1800s twice in the same year for the return of Christ and when Christ didn't return uh, you know William Miller was devastated but come to the scene Ellen G White and she's like no you know we got it wrong it wasn't that Jesus was returning it was that God was going into the uh, tabernacle into the right hand of God and then that's when the investigative judgment began which by the way, you don't need to learn any of that because that's all a lie. But, and, and they've kept this lie going for, for centuries. I mean, the Mormons have re, rewritten and fixed and refixed the Book of Mormons to fit their idea of what their followers need to do for them. You know, if we look at uh, Proverbs 12, 19, but you guys are in Matthew 27, just to finish this point out, it says, The lip of truth shall be established forever, 
but a lying tongue is but for a moment. And so we see this is a picture of salvation because the Bible says that the truth shall set you free. What truth? Jesus Christ is the truth because he's the word and the word is the truth, right? And it says the lip of truth shall be established how long? Forever. But a lying tongue is for but a moment. Now, that's for our life. But the lying tongue, if it leads to hell, it's for all eternity. So we know that there's a proud look. And I really think it's a sequence, right? If you're prideful, well, because of your pride, you can't admit wrong. You end up with a lying tongue. And if we go back to Proverbs uh, 16, I mean, uh, 6, verse 17, it says, a lying look and hand, a lying tongue, sorry. And then the third one is, it says, and hands that shed innocent blood. You know, if that lie gets too far ahead of you, and one of the things that you see in corruption in politics or in government is that when the lie gets too elaborate and there needs to be, uh, there's a need for a cover up, well, how do you cover it up? You have to silence those that want to speak the truth. And sometimes that requires the shedding of innocent blood. The other thing is, we lie to ourselves by telling women they have a choice, uh, by telling ourselves that the, the individual that's inside the womb is not a, a human. You know, there's a lie that leads to the shedding of innocent blood. And the Bible tells us specifically what the consequences are for those that shed innocent blood. Matthew 27, 24 says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult, a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See, ye do it. Now we're going to go to 2 Kings 21 while I, while I elaborate this point. Go to 2 Kings 21. But we see that ultimately the most innocent of all blood was that blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, he, he didn't sin. There was no fault in him. Uh, he, he was perfect in every aspect of his manhood. And what did they do? They crucified him. Now, we know that that was necessary for our salvation, but there are consequences for the shedding of innocent blood. The Bible says in 2 Kings 21, verse 12, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth, it of, heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria, and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to other enemies. So Jesus is telling them that Jerusalem and Judah will be cast off. They will be cut off. And we know now, you know, when with the New Testament, that we are God's chosen people, those that believe in Jesus Christ. But why is he doing this? Why is he so angry at them? Well, verse 15 says, Because they have done that, because they have done that which was evil in my sight, and have provoked me to anger, since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even, even unto this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much, till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides his sins wherewith he made Judah to sin, in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. It wasn't just enough that he shed the innocent blood, but that he caused others to sin with him. You know, whenever we give people the excuse or the opportunity to lie to themselves or to be prideful enough to shed the innocent blood of babies here in this country or even any innocent blood, what we're doing is we're filling the blood with the, the, the we're shedding innocent blood very much from one end to the other. Now, if God did not spare his chosen people in the Old Testament, the physical nation of Israel, of Judah, what makes us think that he's going to spare us? You know, what makes us think that we're going to be uh, free from this? And that's why I believe wholeheartedly that we are going to go through the tribulation because there's just no other way about it. I mean, as Christians, there has to be some, uh, how do you suffer the persecution? How do you have trials? I mean, you have to suffer something, but also for all the other people that have caused so much shedding of blood, uh, have, you know, uh, premeditated murder and sacrifice and worship to idols and gods there has to be a consequence because if you go back there let, let me look at that real quick it says right there at the end it says uh, 16 moreover manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled jerusalem from one to, uh, end to another beside his sin where wherewith he had made judah to sin in doing that which was evil 
in the sight of the Lord. So it wasn't just enough that he was doing it for everybody, but he actually was almost taunting Christ, taunting God with the shedding of innocent blood. I mean, we as Christians know that we should not support abortion or the murder of babies. And yet, this week, people will go out into the voting booths and click Republican ballot all the way because the Republicans are the ones that are supposedly pro-life. Except that they're not because they passed legislation where it's okay to murder a baby within the first trimester or second trimester as long as they don't murder the baby at the end. You know, it's never complete. It's not, it's always like this gray line or this gray area that they tow and they just say whatever they want, what you want to hear so that you can get, uh, you can, they can get your uh, votes. You know, this is why also we as Christians don't shed blood. You know, I had a conversation with someone yesterday that actually attacked my faith uh, very vehemently. And one of the things that they said was, they said, you know, your problem is that you preach uh, murder and you preach hate and you preach, you know, that you're, you, only you're uh, sinless. And I said, well, hold on a second. Let's, let's get these, th these things in order straight. I said, I do preach hate. The Bible says that we should hate the wicked, that we should hate sin. We should hate those that hate God. But the one thing I don't preach is, I do preach that those that are evil, that are an abomination, as we're going to see here, they should be put to death, according to the Bible, by a righteous government. And, you know, and I'm going to send this clip to that individual because it's not about, we as Christians shouldn't take that upon ourselves. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We, we're not warring against the flesh. It's not for us to go out there with a gun or with a militia and try to start a war. No, it's for a righteous government to do righteous in the eyes of God. But that's what separates us. We're not like those radicals in the Muslim world or in other religions that say, look, if you don't believe like we do, we're going to kill you. Look, if you don't believe like we do, I'm just going to tell you one thing. If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be in hell for all eternity. My prayer is that you come to the knowledge and uh, fear and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, a proud look leads us to a lying tongue, which then, if it gets too elaborate, leads to the shedding of innocent blood. And then what's the, what's the next verse say? You know, we'll go back and says in verse 18 says, A heart and a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. And so once you start down that path, that idol worship, you know, and all these pagan religions that have worshipped and shed innocent blood, then there's wicked imaginations. You start doing all kinds of wickedness in the world. If you look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1, it says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am a base among you, but being absent and bold toward you, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us if we walked according to the flesh, as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And so there's that point on, that I made on point number three, but it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pulling down of the strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled and I love that set of verses I've used it before because I just think it's great that what we do is we cast down that imagination. See, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations is that you're puffing it up. You're putting it in an altar so that everybody can see it. See, what's the thing is, if you're doing wickedness, wickedness always wants an audience. You're not going to do wickedness by yourself. You know, I mean, I guess the only people that do that are serial killers, and even they do it with the intent of getting the attention of others, even though they might be uh, uh, deceptive about it. But the thing that happens with a, a, uh, a heart that devices wicked imaginations is it starts to puff itself up. It'll start selling you the lie and it'll go along with the shedding of innocent blood. That's when you start getting, you know, the fornication and the unseemliness and the defilement and the, you know, the, the filth of the world. You know, and what it says there, God's telling us, look, for our weapons of warfare are not carnal. See, we can't fight people physically because it wouldn't amount to anything anyways. It says, but mighty 
uh, through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against God. The way we do it is through the Spirit. It says, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. And having in readiness to revenge all dis How do you get revenge on disobedience? You don't try to beat someone in submission. You can't force anybody to do anything they don't want to anyway. That's why we have free will. It says, when your obedience is fulfilled. See, if your heart is trying to be obedient to God, it won't devise wicked imaginations because it's too busy trying to uh, bring into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. Go to Genesis 6 while I, while I read for you Romans 1. And Romans 1 is the famous reprobate uh, doctrine and the reprobate uh, verses. And, you know, if you really tie all these six or seven, I mean, these seven attributes that God's talking about in Proverbs, what we're doing is we're, we're describing the reprobate. And it says there uh, in Romans 1, 21, says, because that when they knew God, see, they know of God. They glorify him not as God. See, they don't recognize God. As a matter of fact, and another way to say this is they hate God. It says, neither were they thank neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolishness, and their foolish heart was darkened. So a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, Romans 1 21 is covered. It says they were vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened darkened. And what is vanity? You know, it's basically being fruitless. So when you, you're putting imaginations to wickedness, you're reaping nothing but fruitlessness or uh, emptiness. It, it, it reaps no reward. There's no purpose behind it. What you're doing is you're just leading people astray. And if you have false preachers, it's even worse because they're leading people to hell. You know, let's go uh, to the next, oh, Genesis 6, verse 5. Sorry, I was going to get in myself, but it says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It wasn't evil just sometime. It was evil continually. The Bible tells us that that's how it's going to be in the end times, right? And it, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the earth, for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, a good point to make there is that if Noah found grace in the Lord, he didn't have any of these attributes. He, did, he wasn't devising wickedness in his heart. He wasn't creating a wicked imagination in his heart. And so, you know, it's a... Uh, and, and if you follow this, I mean, I guess you could say that someone could be devising wickedness, wickedness in their heart or having wicked imagination and not have all the other attributes. But the reality is they kind of start to compound one on top of the other. You know, you have the proud, uh, proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, you know, uh, uh, and hard to devise a wicked imagination. If you go back to verse 18 of Proverbs 6, it says, feet that be swift in running to mischief. Or running to hurt. You know, it's not just enough that they're running to mischief. The word mischief is not just, you know, we think of mischief or mischievous as someone who's acting up or, or they're devising something, but it really also means that you're devising something evil or to hurt, to cause pain. You know, if you look at Acts 13, 4, and then we're going to be in Proverbs 4. So Acts 13, and then we're going to be in Proverbs 4. It says, So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus, and when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John in, to their minister. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So this guy's calling for Barnabas and Saul, but Elamias, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes upon him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, 
thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And when he went out seeking some to lead him by the hand, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. The thing is, we, uh, <clears throat> feet that are running to mischief is to hurt. Well, what's the thing that can be the most hurtful? Is impeding someone to be saved by Jesus Christ. See, I think, I believe that sometimes when we go soul winning and those dogs are barking, I think that that's the devil, you know, being an LMIS. At times, though, it might not even be that. It's just someone that gets in the way. You know, I, the one thing I hate is when I'm so winning to a young lady or just a, a lady in general. And the reason I pick ladies is because it doesn't usually happen the opposite. Is you're there preaching at the door or, you know, you caught them in the parking lot and you're halfway through the gospel. You know they're listening and it happens more often than not. All of a sudden the boyfriend or the husband comes and what do they do? They interrupt it. Their feet are running to mischief. They're quick to come in and interrupt that thing that is good for them. And, you know, the Bible tells us there in Proverbs 4, verse 10, says, Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let, let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. So there's, when you're running to mischief, it's a specific type of path, is what the Bible's telling us. Verse 15 says, Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat bread of wickedness, and drink the wine of violence. But the path, of the just is as the shining light and shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of wickedness is darkness. They know not at what they stumble. And as you can see, he's talking about running and a path and a way. And what did he say? He says, stay away from it. You know, let's go back to that verse right there. Uh, in verse 15, it says, avoid it. He didn't just say, and then he could have ended it there, but he says, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. See, the challenge is that we shouldn't just avoid it. We shouldn't even pass by it. We should turn from it. We should pass away. You know, I had a, I know I keep making a reference to this uh, tough conversation, because yesterday evening as I was preparing for these sermons, I get a call from somebody. It's a family member. And the only purpose of the call was to tell me that if I'm going to be showing up to these events with the family, that I need to stop preaching the Word of God. And you know what? That tells me that these are feet that are running to mischief, and I need to not only avoid it, I need to pass away from it, I need to not turn to it, I need to not pass around it, meaning that if I can't spend time with those family members, well then so be it. But I'm not going to be silenced by preaching the Word of God. See, it says right there that if you're running to mischief you're running to cause people to fall see I'd rather be running to Christ I'd rather run the narrow road but if you're looking if you, if you just look at the order of how these things work is it starts out with pride you know it's interesting because the conversation I had yesterday just worked out perfect you know the person that I was speaking to was very prideful in their in, in their talk towards me and, and then they changed the tone to match you know, my passion behind what I was preaching to them. And then I caught them in several lies. You know, at one, at one point they agreed with me and then they disagreed. Now, there's not a sh shedding of innocent blood. I don't know. Maybe if I would have been in front of them, they, things might have gotten a little more heated, but it was over the phone. So thank God when I was in a position where I could see that. But there were, there's a heart that divides the wicked imaginations. You know, one of the things that, that really stood out was the manipulation behind the conversation. You know, the individual was praising me on one end for being staunch on my, on, my, uh, on my radicalness or my dogmatic way of living for Christ. But then they're like, but on the other end, they're like, but don't. Don't, don't be that staunch around us. Do it on your own, but don't be around us. And then it says, feet that are swift to run into mischief. You know, one of the things that I was arguing was that, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with my sodomite family. I don't want to have anything to do with these queers being around my children. 
I don't want to put my children in a position where they might be hurt because of these evil pedophiles. And yet somehow this individual was trying to justify that, you know, as long as it's in a family environment, it wasn't that bad. You know, let's go, let's look, and we got two more, and then we'll complete the abomination right here. It says, uh, feet that be swift to running into mischief. And then verse 19 says, a false witness that speaketh lies. So it's not just enough to have a lying tongue, but see, the challenge is then it leads to the lies where you're, where you're having a false witness against somebody. And, and uh, if you turn there to Matthew 5, and then we're going to be in Romans 13. Matthew 5 says, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus says, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do ye not understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out in the, into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, or shedding of innocent blood, adulteries and fornications, thefts, you know, we can just add those to pride and, uh, you know, wicked imaginations and, uh, you know, running to mischief. Then it says, false witness blasphemies. Well, if you think about it, what did they do to Jesus Christ? They raised a false witness and they blasphemed his name. It says, These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not. See, we have to be careful about what we're saying about others and what people say about us. See, if people are speaking a false witness against us, then it's probably a good sign that we're preaching the word of God. But we shouldn't just come forth and speak a false witness about somebody without really analyzing it or trying that spirit biblically. Go to Romans 13. It says, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another, and that's verse 8, sorry, Romans 13, verse 8, hath fulfilled the law for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. What is he doing? He's quoting the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in the saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill toward, to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And Proverbs 21, 28 says, A false witness shall perish, but the man that heareth speaketh constantly. You know, I, I, I picked that verse because sometimes I get a little long-winded in my sermons or, or I get, you know, long-winded in a thought, but... I understand that verse now because if you're hearing the Word of God, all you want to do is speak constantly of the Word of God and the truths that you're learning. And you want others to enjoy the benefits of being saved and living a righteous life. And by the way, let me make this statement clear. I want to live a righteous life. I don't know necessarily that I'm always righteous. So let's make sure that that's clear. I'm not patting myself on the back. But if you're hearing the Word of God constantly, you can correct those things in your life. And, and before you start correcting anything, though, make sure you have your salvation straight. And let's just get to the final point there in, uh, in Proverbs 16. We have a false witness that speaketh lies. But here, the Lord hates these six things. He hates a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devices wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies. But when you add the seventh, Now it becomes an abomination. It says, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. That's the worst one, in my opinion. Because see, we expect some of these things from the world. We expect some of this from just human nature. But the Bible says brethren there, meaning those that are saved. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Bible says the Lord thinks that is an abomination when you add all it together and then you go and sow discord among the brethren. Proverbs 6, verses 12 through 15, if you go just a few verses up there, it says, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh his eye, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. There shall his calamity come suddenly, Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. In other words, when you put it all together, he's winking at you. He's kind of planning it out. He's being, he's being a sociopath or maybe even a psychopath in the sense that he's being manipulative in the way that he's trying to get you to uh, either speak against another brother and sister in Christ or against a certain doctrine 
or you know and, and I and I'll give you a real easy example because this is so easy to deal with you ever meet somebody and all of a sudden you realize they're Christian like you and they're like man that's great like a stranger I've it's, this has happened to me more than once you oh man I, I believe on the Lord Jesus that's great that's awesome and then you get a little bit deeper into the conversation and the topic always comes up of the queers right and all of a sudden you're like no you know I'm, I'm, I believe in the reprobate doctrine I think that you know they're reprobate and we shouldn't have anything to do with them oh no you know God's not God's always been love and we should include them and we should preach to them and we should love them and we should care for them and and that's sowing discord among the brethren we should be united in one front against all wickedness not just some wickedness all wickedness go to Titus 3 1 and then uh, we'll be back in Proverbs and we'll close out Titus 3 1 says Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He set on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. You notice that you can't, I mean, good works are important, but it's after you believe in God. It says, these things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable, unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So this gives us instructions of not only how we should look at ourselves, we should be reminded of how we were and how we shouldn't take these old attributes and apply them to how we deal with the brothers and sisters in Christ moving forward. See, I don't always agree with everybody that I talk to. As a matter of fact, you know, the way, being the way that I am, that I overanalyze things, it's very hard for me to just accept anything that even from a preacher that I hear. But I, you don't just jump and be like, oh, preacher, I heard what you said, and I don't know if I agree, and by the way, you know, I think you're wrong. And all. No, the Bible tells us that we need to put that away because God renewed us, and we need to study the Scripture. And then the other thing is, because I'm real infamous before I got saved, I loved foolish questions, and I loved contentions and strivings about the law, but they were unprofitable. After we admonish a brother or sister in Christ once and then twice, we need to just reject it and move on. See, one of the things that is going to help us not sow discord among the brethren is to not partake in it. You know, it's very easy to get uh, involved in those fights, but if you're caught into it, then you can't lead because you're caught in, in the tumult. And let's go ahead and just close this all out. So let's take a look at this real quick. You know, seven are an abomination. We need to avoid pride, and we need to preach against the pride of the world. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies. Those are the six that God hates. But when you add, he that soweth discord among the brethren, that's an abomination. And so in conclusion, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 8, 7, says, For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. You know, the thing that we need to focus on is, we need to be aware of this so that we're not caught in all seven of those. And not only that, we need to speak truth, so, and wickedness is in a, we should avoid the wickedness so it doesn't come out of our lips. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone that is proud and hard is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. The Bible tells us that they're going to be punished. But let's look at the, the final verses here in Luke 16, uh, verse 14. He says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And to deride means that they, they hated him, they disdained him, they didn't like what he was saying. This is Jesus, it says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, 
And, and I know I used this verse last week, but this verse just stands out so strong in my mind lately. It says, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now the thing that I want you to pay attention to is that when he had told them these things, when they had heard all these things, the first thing they did was they derided him. See, when you esteem the words of other men, you're going to deride or you're going to hate those that love God. And one of the things that's very clear is that you should be aware that when people are attacking your spiritual uh, walk with God, when people are attacking your faith and they're deriding you, then you got to be careful because you might be dealing with someone who's abominable, someone who is wicked. It says, and they highly esteem among men is abom for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. See, it's not just enough, you know, we can pick on Hollywood and how they have the Oscars and the Emmys. But here's another thing. Sometimes we get with family members, and even if they don't agree, all of a sudden, you know, you've heard the enemy of my enemy is my friend. All of a sudden, these individuals can deride against you, and they esteem each other in their own wickedness. And we have to be aware of that, because what did it say in Proverbs? You know, we shouldn't pass by it. We shouldn't look from it. We should get away from it, we shouldn't even turn to it. You know, so the big thing that I wanted to leave you with, and this stood out because we're dealing with a lot here in, in the closing days of, of October. You know, we've got Halloween coming up, we've got the elections, we've got the end of another year. There was a shooting yesterday. You know, the media is always telling us what we need to think and, and, and choose and do. But what we should do is scrutinize everything and say, okay, what are the things that God considers hateful? And what are the things that God considers an abomination? You know, let's close out with that. You know. But I'm going to review it just one more time. You know, we need to be careful for a proud look. Politics is all about pride. And so is worshiping the devil, right? A lying tongue. The media lies to you constantly. So maybe we should put our faith and our trust and our time in the Word of God. Hands that shed innocent blood. Look, we justify the shedding of innocent blood. Forget for a moment the murdering of babies. That, that's an easy subject because I mean, as a Christian, I mean, almost any Christian, even those that don't agree with us, completely get behind that bandwagon. But what about the warmongering? You know, we're, we're out there in all these countries killing all these innocent people that, that they've never done anything to us. And yet somehow we're justifying it and we're out there just shedding innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. We've got ambassadors to this country that are open sodomites that are going to other nations teaching them the wickedness that we partake in here in this country. It says, feet that be swift, running to mischief. You know, we've got a nation that's quick. I mean... You just go out here in the world and just pick, pick your poison is basically the, the best way to describe it. What are, what are people running to? I mean, I just read an article and I couldn't believe what I, I had to read it twice. I literally thought it was a joke about these little, they're young girls, like 11 to 13 year old girls who had a plan to murder young children in sacrifice to the occult. They were practicing occult and they found their, their handwriting, they found their plan and they stopped it. Somebody found it and took a picture and called the police. And they were actually, where they found them was exactly how they had planned it. They found them in one of the restrooms where they were waiting for these little kids to come in so that they could abduct them and kill them. And you know, they had all the tools. I mean, obviously they're 11 and 13, so they had scissors and cheap knives. But you think about it, an 11 and 13, or when I was 11 and 13, believe me, the last thing from my mind was how to uh, do th things in the occult. Well, why do we have that? Why have you ever seen anything on Disney Channel? or Nickelodeon. I mean, it's all about witches and goblins and the occult and, you know, whatever is out there. I remember my, my sister, and this is many years ago, she used to love this show called Sabrina the Teenage Witch. I mean, who, why would we, my parents allow something like that? I'm just thinking to myself now, you might think about it, just about a witch and all that. And anyways, I'm getting off on a tangent. I don't want to. It says, a false witness that speaketh lies. The biggest thing also is when other Christians are talking raising a false witness against those men and women of God, especially those men that stand behind the pulpit that are preaching hard, and all of a sudden people are making up stuff. And you look at just throughout history, and you look at the men and women, especially the men that have led behind the pulpits, and a lot of them, the ones that stood strong in the faith, they, were, they have a lot of false stories and things, and nothing could ever be proven, but people have said things about them. And then the final thing is, when you raise a false witness, you're going to sow that discord. And I mean, over, over time, you've heard of church splits and people just not going to church for certain reasons. I mean, we, here in our turnaround service, our numbers are lower than in the regular service. And, you know, why does that happen? Because 
as time goes on, people just sow discord. I'm not saying that we have it here in this church. Probably we do, just like in any church. I'm not going to pretend. But what's the reason? It's because people don't want to follow their Bible. What they want to do is just follow their heart, and they want to devise wicked things. So anyways, I hope that message was helpful. I know it wasn't all fancy or anything, but it was just a very specific thing that God laid in my heart. These are seven things that, that are an abomination to the Lord that we need to be not only careful not to partake ourselves, but we need to stay clear from and not partake in it, period. So let's go ahead and we'll close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to preach. Thank you for those that are here today uh, that were able to listen to this message, and I hope that it fed them and that it nourished them in, in, in uh, the spiritual meat and milk of the word, Lord. And now... Uh, or milk and meat, right? That's the, the proper order. But Lord, help us to just go out there, prepare our hearts and our souls for the soul waiting that's going to be doing, that we're going to be doing this afternoon. Just help us to go out there and lead many to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.